uh, praying for those that are watching on live stream uh, in these very trying times in the United States. We're, we're continuing our uh, sermon series on Sunday mornings, and this will probably be the last one of the first three, and then we'll do three more in a couple of weeks as I address some other issues. But, uh, amen, this morning, uh, power for right now, uh, we have a graphic here, power for right now, uh, we are dealing with Holy Spirit witnesses, amen, Acts chapter 1, verse 4, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, verse 4 and 5, and then verse 8, it's called the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. There's an incredible number of verses in the Word of God about the Holy Spirit, also known as the Holy Ghost, the Spirit, the Comforter, the Helper, the Advocate. These names, referring to the exact same concept of God the Holy Spirit, are used over 200 times in the New Testament. The Old Testament has even more mentions. Anything that God mentions so often must be vitally important to our lives and we need to understand the purpose and the functions of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we're going to look at the Holy Ghost in the New Testament, primarily in the book of Acts, which should be called, by the way, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Reviewing last week, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring God's power to your life personally. How many need power for right now? Amen. Everybody always talks about if you do that, if you do this, if you do this, if this happens, if that happens, and then you'll be there, then you'll hear, then you'll rise to hear, then this will happen. No, no, how many need power for right now? Yes. yes. I think America needs power for right now. Oh, yes. The purpose of the Holy Ghost is to bring that power to our lives personally. And we're going to go through the book of Acts to see what should happen in us and through us. If we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, there are certain things that ought to be happening in and through us, and the book of Acts reveals that to us. Amen. And so today we're going to lay a foundation for the role of the Holy Spirit in witnessing. The Holy Spirit makes people witnesses of His power, of His glory, testimony of what He's done in our lives, the power of God to save, to set free, to deliver, to break through, amen, to set the captives free, hallelujah, amen, to heal the brokenhearted. Amen. Supernaturally. Supernaturally, God helps us to witness and testify to a lost and dying world. I want to talk first about what's the point of the Holy Spirit. Modern Christianity has twisted awfully the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the charismatic movement, the Pentecostal movement, the, the, the Spirit of God moving in and through churches. Amen is a powerful reality that obviously the enemy has used and gotten involved on the inside and uh, attempted horribly to ruin the reputation of what the Holy Ghost is doing in churches today. Yes. To reduce the Holy Spirit to a feeling or to an experience. And you'll see people that have never known the Holy Ghost outside of an emotional uh, frenzy. So-called modern revivals. People describe it only, as, uh, only like this. I felt it. Now, I like to experience the power of the Holy Ghost in revival as much as the next person. I, 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 I like to feel the Holy Ghost move. I, amen. But the response should not just be experiential but one of a dynamic practicality. Amen. The Holy Ghost should do practical things in our lives where our lives are filled with a, uh, a practical element that changes us and those influenced by us. So the Holy Ghost should be in us and working through us to dynamically alter the lives of others that know us and are under our influence. 
And it shouldn't be just about, oh, I feel this. Or, you feel God, you feel God, and that's all. No, the Holy Ghost has to change you. It has to be a dynamic, uh, supernatural experience in your life that causes you to be infectious to those around you. Come on, somebody. Amen. The tingle, the thrill, the excitement. Sounds like a live sporting event more than church. Always an emotional experience. I felt, they say, I, 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 I shook. Bizarre manifestations, barking, weird contortions, out of control laughter have all been uh, examples uh, of a craziness that the enemy wants to use, uh, amen, to make Pentecostal Christianity uh, too crazy to pursue. And, there's, and that's what they want to do. They want to make the church powerless. They want, this is what the enemy wants. And, and the, de the demons of hell want to make sure that everybody is so afraid of the Holy Ghost in church that they go to these dry, non-Holy Ghost churches. Uh, all, they don't want to be anywhere near power. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. Rid the church of its power, which is the Holy Spirit. And the third person of the Trinity, I might add, amen. God, the Holy Spirit, equal to. God the Father and God the Son. So, the Holy Ghost did not come as the comforter so that you could bizarrely manifest with barking, put your legs up like a cockroach, <laughs> out of control laughter. That's not what this is about. John MacArthur, American pastor and author known for his internationally syndicated Christian teaching radio program, Grace to You, attacks charismatic Pentecostals. Now, I know there's an assault on the Holy Spirit baptism in our generation anyway, and I know he does not believe in the Holy Spirit moving in this day and age, but I have to admit, kooky people have given him plenty of ammo, and the videos he shows are not what we do, and it's not what the Holy Ghost is intended for, and it's not who we are. Come on, somebody. Praise God. The Holy Ghost is used to reach the world. That's why from, from one church of 29 people, seven of which were Pastor Mitchell's own family, to less than 50 years later, less than 50 years later, 2,700 churches in over 130 countries. That's what we are. That's the Holy Ghost. That's what the Holy Ghost is doing. The Holy Ghost is taking a bold witness, a Holy Ghost testimony, a powerful move of God, and, and, and making it dynamic throughout the lost and dying world. And that's what the Holy Ghost is about. That's what the book of Acts is. You won't see anybody barking in the book of Acts. You won't see anybody falling over in, in, in divine laughter in, in the book of Acts. If you cannot find your church in the book of Acts, you better find a new church. But as you read the book of Acts, and you read it verse by verse and chapter by chapter, what do you see? You see what we are. You see what we do. You see what we're doing to take the world. You see us in the book of Acts as a fellowship. The Brownsville Laughing Revival. Amen. See, the Holy Rollers title came from crazy people out of control, not from the genuine move of the Holy Spirit. And the Brownsville Laughing Revival is a perfect example. Nobody got saved. The local community was not impacted for Jesus. And now the entire movement, the entire Laughing Revival movement has left behind a trail of tears, broken churches, confused, backslidden Christians, and an embarrassing legacy. That's what's left. How do you know whether something's of God or not? There's a legacy of power. A legacy of, of a dynamism. A legacy of God moving powerfully. The purpose of the infilling must involve witness. It must involve you telling somebody about what God has done. In you, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, the very first thing that, that is said after giving you the power of the Holy Ghost is that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the utter ends of the earth. Witness, definition for the word witness means one who bears record, one who tells or shows what they have seen or heard. See, there must be 
a witness of power. The people that know you, your relatives, your friends, your co-workers, they must see a dynamic power of God in your life. That's what the Holy Spirit will do for you. Amen. There must be a witness of power. Consider this. The power comes first. The witness then comes from the power. The word power comes from the Greek word transliterated as dunamis. And that's where we derive our English words dynamic and dynamite. How many know power in the Holy Ghost is dynamite? Amen. Power of the Holy Ghost is dynamic. So this word was chosen on purpose uh, to, to show the world a dynamic, powerful people filled with the Holy Ghost and changing the world. Amen. Uh, I fear those that have turned the world upside down have come here also, says the book of Acts about the disciples that are preaching the gospel all over. They turned the world upside down. Twelve of them. Twelve. Amen. See, a powerful witness to others is evidence of power in your life. Speaking in tongues is not enough, and we'll get to that in a future component, but some people speak in tongues and their lives are completely powerless. So speaking in tongues is not what we're dealing with. Speaking in tongues is the evidence of the infilling. Amen. How boldness to witness, power to witness is the actual fruit of being filled with, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so I ask you this question, what is the identifiable power of the Holy Spirit in your life? When people look at you, co-workers, friends, relatives, when they look at you, amen, do they see the power of the Holy Ghost? Do they already know without you talking? Do they know there is something different about that guy, about that girl, about that lady? There's something different about them. See, there must be a witness to Jesus. Verse 8 again, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria and under the ends of the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit produces witness to Jesus Christ. A verbal witness, a verbal witness is evangelism. Evangelism is telling people who don't know Jesus about Jesus. How many can say that? How many know that very simple thing? That very simple thing. Telling people who don't know Jesus about Jesus. It should be the easiest thing in the world. How many know how stinking hard that is? How many know how intimidating that is? How many know how the devil likes to make that seem? Oh, come on. Like, like, yeah, you're going to look like a fool to a stranger that you've never met. You're going to talk to them. You know, God's speaking to you. Talk to somebody on the bus or, 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 or on the street or, or in the store. And, and you're going to go up to them. You don't know them. They might never see you again. But no, no, the devil's got you worried about you. In the midst of what God wants to do about him. Are you hearing me? A verbal witness is evangelism. Acts 8, verse 4. Now those who were scattered went around preaching the word. Acts twenty two fifteen. 15. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. That's the power for right now. Amen. That what they have seen and what they have heard, they will tell the world. To say that we have the Holy Spirit in us and there not be a witness of evangelism is just plain wrong. It's a contradiction. If you have the Holy Spirit in you and the power of the dunamis, the dynamite of God in you, then it is impossible not to tell somebody about Jesus. It's impossible not, amen, to, to let it out. It's impossible to contain it. Amen. And so, you're missing the point of the Spirit's power. It is for others, not only you. Acts chapter 8, verse 19 and 20. Amen. Saying, give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Note this. 
He doesn't ask them to lay their hands on him that he might receive the Holy Ghost, that he might have these gifts to exercise himself, that he might be touched and filled with God. No, uh, uh, but only that he might have the power to confer this power to others. All he wanted to do was have something that he could manipulate others with. He had no interest in being filled, no interest in operating in the Holy Spirit, just in manipulating others for money, which was the ability to confer this power on them. And that's how dynamic the practical evidence of the Holy Spirit was in the New Testament church, that this one guy saw it so dynamic that he wanted to buy it so he could give it to others and manipulate them in the process of money. That's, is your life so powerful and so evident of the Holy Ghost that people are asking, I'll give you money if you give me what you have. Maybe it should be if it's not. Come on, somebody. Amen. Praise God. So let's talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will work in us. The Holy Spirit will work in us. The Holy Spirit produces boldness in us. How many need a bolder walk with God? Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Are you hearing me? They were filled with the Holy Ghost and they began and continued to speak with boldness. Boldness is the outflow of being filled, baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces stirring in us. You ever been stirred to do something for God? You ever been stirred to tell somebody something? You ever been stirred to minister to somebody or to buy somebody groceries, drop it off of their, uh, their, their, their front porch? Have you ever been stirred to, to call somebody and say, hey, are you all right? That's the Holy Spirit. Amen. A natural result of the Spirit inside of us is a desire to witness to others, a stirring to reach out beyond ourselves. A stirring in a church that is filled with the Holy Ghost should be to, to reach out to others in the neighborhood, in the community. When the Holy Spirit comes, a missionary spirit is birthed in the heart of the receiving vessel. Amen. You should have a heart for the lost, a heart for overseas, a heart for what we do. Amen. In the, in, in, in the other parts of the earth, you ask anybody uh, of the six of us that went on our team to Zambia, and they will tell you how amazing and life changing that was. Dustin still talks like acts like he can talk in Yanja. Well, uh. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter five fourteen for the love of Christ compels us. Another word would be controls us because we have concluded this that one died for all, then all. Died. In the late 60s and the early 70s, there was a powerful, transformative movement called the Jesus Movement. The Jesus People Movement was a unique combination of the hippie counterculture and evangelical Christianity. It first appeared in the, front, in the famed Summer of Love in 1967 in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury District. And it spread like wildfire. Amen. In Southern California. Why do you think... California is so uh, against the gospel because that's where modern day revival started. And the enemy is closing it down. Only God can open it up. Amen. And so uh, it spread like wildfire in Southern California and beyond the cities like Prescott, Arizona, Seattle, Atlanta, and Milwaukee. Our fellowship is the lasting fruit of that genuine movement. In 1971, the growing movement found its way into the national media spotlight and gained momentum, attracting a huge new following among evangelical church youth who enthusiastically adopted the Jesus People persona as their own. The Jesus People movement was one of the most important American religious movements of the 20th century. Not only do such new and burgeoning evangelical groups as our fellowship, Christian Fellowship Ministries Worldwide, but Calvary Chapel, Vineyard, both trace uh, back uh, to the Jesus people as well. The movement paved the way for the huge contemporary Christian music industry. It, it actually gave birth to Christian music as we know it today. 
Amen. It gave birth to choruses in church that were not hymns. It gave birth to guitars and keyboards and, and, and drums in church services. Amen. Um, uh, it actually is uh, accounted for the rise of praise music in the nation's churches. It evolutionized evangelicals' relationship with young people and popular culture. Amen. The Jesus People Movement not only helped create a resurgent evangelism, uh, uh, but uh, must be considered one of the formative powers that shaped American youth in the late 60s and 70s. People were saved and filled with the Holy Spirit by the thousands, the hundreds of thousands. And then instantly wanted to tell others as it spread across the country. One man got saved in a Prescott music scene in Prescott, Arizona. Went back home to Boston, Massachusetts. And brought back his best friend. And now some of our largest churches, some of our leadership churches are pastored by the men that he went back to get. You, this thing I've seen in Prescott, you've got to come with me. You've got to see this. And, and, and they went with him to Prescott. Tom Payne was among one of them uh, in, in the early years. He now is in charge of our fellowship uh, of 130 churches in Australia. Amen. Praise God. Uh, Mark Olson. Uh, amen. The leadership in the Tempe uh, Church Fellowship. Uh, there's just so much, much, much more that I can say it is unbelievable what God has done in our fellowship. One church of 29 people, seven of which were Pastor Mitchell's own family, up to 2,700 churches all over the world. Amen. See, the Holy Spirit will work for us as well. There's a supernatural help in witnessing and evangelism, directing us to open hearts, giving us favor with people, uh, and opening doors of opportunity. Acts chapter 8 verse 29. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. See the exact person. At the exact moment. God directed one guy. That knew the gospel. To go and meet with a guy that God was working with. Supernatural. Go and talk to this guy. The guy got saved, baptized as well. God is into the exact person at the exact moment. And this sometimes involves divine appointments, which is God planning and directing us to a specific people at specific times. My personal example, I was on a three-day drug and alcohol binge. I was at a farm in Winesburg with a bunch of college buddies, and we were wrapped we were completely wiped out. Three-day binge, no sleep, uh, copious amounts of alcohol and drugs. And, and, and I have to work. I'm working at McDonald's. My brother's the boss. I have to work. So my friends took me back to uh, Dover uh, in, in their car. Yeah, driving uh, back to Dover. I couldn't get out of the back seat. So they came, opened the door, rolled me out on the parking lot, and left. I'm laying on the parking lot in Dover McDonald's. I pull myself up, and I stumble literally like this into a crowded, into a crowded lobby. I push my way through people, and I go behind the counter, and I start to try to clock in. But I can't see the numbers, I can't remember the numbers, and I'm just pressing buttons, and it's beeping, and I'm laughing, and it's beeping, and I'm laughing, and I'm falling over, and, 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 and finally a manager came and grabbed me, and, and it took me in the back and said, get in the, get in the freezer, and, and unload the truck, and, and don't get anywhere near people. That first box of fries that came down that ramp hit me in the chest, knocked me on the floor, and all the other boxes of fries landed on top of me, and I'm underneath a pile of french fry boxes, when the manager came in and said, get up and help me get up. Your brother's on the phone. So I went back in. And I was like, no, son, no, son, no. That's how it was. It was awful. It was, it was unbelievable. Three-day binge. And my brother says, you're fired. 
Go home. Fired from McDonald's by your own brother. There's a legacy. I uh, got a DUI right after. Got kicked out of my house. Finally got another job. And the, the owner of the restaurant was the pastor of the Four Square Church in Denison. George Brady. So I'm somewhat sober now. I've settled down a bit because my life is falling apart, every part of it. And I'm working, and uh, George, uh, in, immediately, I mean, I'm not even there a minute, and, and George's son, uh, Bill, uh, is it Bill? Uh, George, Bob Brayton, George's son, Bob, uh, immediately says, so what do you think about Jesus? And my answer was, I don't think about him at all. And that's when it began. He told me to take my break. So I went and sat down on my break. And there were a couple picked up their, their drinks and sat down with me. Their name was uh, Bill and Sandy Thompson. And they sat down with me and they introduced themselves. And so they're witnessing to me. I've got a 30-minute you know, a, a break. They're witnessing to me. I couldn't wait to get up. I'm looking at my watch. <laughs> and finally, uh, uh, my time is up. And I start to get up. And Bob Brayton leans over the counter. No, Tom, take as long as you want. We're not busy. Stay there. I said, do I like, have to stay here? He said, yeah, stay there. All of that is now history. As they led me to Jesus. Which led me to the, uh, the fellowship. Uh, a number of things. My mom yelled at me when she kicked me out of the house after I got fired from my brother. You need to find religion or find the military or something, but get out of my house. I've had it with you. I found both. I got saved and joined the Air Force. And that's where the Air Force took me to our fellowship worldwide. Amen. The exact person at the exact moment got the exact job. Come on, somebody. That I needed. God was chasing me. Big time. And he found me. I was lost. Amen. And so, uh, there's another man in our fellowship, Tony Huang. He was praying in a Catholic church. God, if you're real, give me a sign. He left there, and there was a, he was in a shopping area, and someone handed him a flyer that said, if you're looking for a sign from God, this is it. He got saved. Now part of our fellowship. One of our young men is not here anymore. I think, I, I think he's in college up in Akron. I'm, I'm not sure. One of our young men was driving north of Canton in an old rickety car with the window open north of Canton. And he's thinking about how his life is backslidden and it's a mess and how he needs Jesus. And all of a sudden he goes flap, 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 flap. And right in through his window, lands on his lap, looks straight up at him, is a flyer from our church 50 miles away. Philadelphia. A flyer. He had his window down on the highway 65 miles an hour and flat, flat, flat through the window. What are the chances? What are the chances of that? Thankfully, he came to our church. He was here for quite some time. People witnessing to someone about to commit suicide over and over and over. There are testimonies of that happening. I have one, Brian Tasker. In Zambia, I told that story before. I'll tell it again sometime, but not today. One pastor and our fellowship witnessed to an older Indian man who prayed the sinner's prayer, was weeping, and testified, I was waiting for the next train to jump in front of it and commit suicide. That's what I was doing here. Michael Wright was witnessing an American Samoa. A man prayed just a few minutes before he had written a suicide note to his family. And now he's gotten saved. God sent Michael right to him at that very moment. The Holy Spirit will work through us. Can you say amen? Amen. When someone filled with the Holy Ghost witnesses, the Holy Spirit brings his power to their hearts. Acts, amen, chapter 2, verse 37. And the Bible says, Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? See, we call this anointing. We call it endowment uh, for, with power from on high. We call it 
divine effectiveness. That's what the Holy Ghost does. In 1983, Fijian Aparosa Navarro was playing soccer for his team on Sunday. The field was right next door to a church that had a speaker playing the sermon to the outside. Aparosa was ready to receive a pass in an official soccer game, but he heard over the speaker, one day you will have to meet Jesus. When I heard this, he said, I felt terrible. There was a tense feeling in my stomach. And as the ball came to me, uh, came at me, I just couldn't kick it properly. So I turned around, and right then and there, I walked across to that little church. The crowd thought I'd gone mad. And there was a big crowd that yelled at me. But I kept walking. I heard the preacher invite people to come and receive Christ's wonderful and free gift of forgiveness and salvation. I just kept walking all the way to the front of that church. My team was upset, he said. But I told them it was more uh, uh, urgent for me to be ready to meet Jesus than to play soccer. So I decided to resign from the team because we always played on Sundays. Uh, and... and um, I had represented Fiji in the New Zealand tour of the youth soccer team and was assured a great future in professional soccer. The team couldn't understand it. Here I am, walking away. I resigned. I had to withdraw from the South Pacific Games to be held in Samoa, but the team asked me to meet with them just before they left for Samoa and tell them again why I walked off the field and had a soccer forever. As a result of my testimony that day, two more team members gave their lives to Jesus Christ and became Christians. That's what God can do with the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to close with this thought. Uh, there's a priority to the Holy Spirit. How many can say amen? We have to look at it as a priority. This is the comforter. This is the third person of the Trinity. This, we're, we're all, we, we, we talk about Jesus. We talk about God. But probably one one hundredth of the time we mention the Holy Spirit. But this is the dispensation. This is the age of grace. This is the church age. This is the dispensation of grace. This is the Holy Spirit's time. This is His function. This is His purpose. He is the comforter. He is the advocate. He is the third person of the Trinity. He is here for the book of Acts church. He is here for the Pius house in New Philadelphia. He is here for you. Amen. The work of witnessing requires supernatural power. And it's foolish to attempt a supernatural work with natural power. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Yes. Luke 5, 5, and Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night, we took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. We know the story. Jesus filled those nets with 150 some fish. Because without him, even fishermen could do nothing. Trying to attract people, trying to convince people, trying to change people, impossible without the Holy Ghost. So Jesus gives the answer and the priority in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power. This is the answer. This is how you change people. This is how you attract people. This is how you convince people. Amen. You receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and the other ends of the earth. We're part of the other ends of the earth part. Amen. The answer is a supernatural infilling with a supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. He can change you into what you need to be. He can do what you cannot do. Acts 1, 4 and 5. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you, you, will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Don't leave until you get it, he said. Don't depart until the Holy Spirit comes. Don't live without it. It's impossible. This is most important. Yes. Luke 24, 49. And behold, 
I'm sending the promise of my Father to you, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. But stay in the city until you are uh, clothed with power from on high. Do you have this kind of power? You can ask for it. You can seek it. And you can make it a priority today. It's about to answer. Power for right now, for this moment, for this second. In the midst of coronavirus outbreak, in the midst of what is called a pandemic, in the midst of a, of a nation filled and gripped with fear, yea, even a world gripped with fear, you and I can be filled with the Holy Ghost and have within us the power from on high to overcome. This is the powerful truth of where we are today. And what God wants to do in your lives. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, if you're not right with God, if you're watching me on live stream, and you're not born again, you would indicate that somehow. We would love to pray for you. We're believing God together in this place. Amen. If you, uh, if you want to get your life right with God right now, this moment, because I believe the time, I mean, how can you, how can you live in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic and not think about being right with God? What's it going to take for you to pull your knickers up and get back into action for the things of God? What's it going to take? What's it going to take? Because it's, in the last days, it's going to get harder than this, I promise you. You're not saved, you're not born again, you're not right with God. Would you like to give your life to Jesus Christ right now, right here, this morning? I wonder if you'd raise your hand in here. Amen. If you're in your homes, you're watching this, pay attention, I'm going to pray a prayer with you right now. Backslidden, you're away from God, you're not where you need to be. You want to get your heart right. You want to return to fellowship with Jesus Christ. You want to begin again to walk with God. Or maybe this is the first time you've ever asked Him to be your Lord and Savior. You repeat this prayer with me. Every head's bowed. Every eye's closed. Say this with me right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity. I ask you right now to come into my heart to save me, to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died for me. And on the third day you rose from the dead. And I ask you right now to make me whole, to save me and forgive me. That I can walk with you and spend eternity with you. And have the power to overcome the issues of my life. I thank you for touching me today. For coming into my heart. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. If you're on live stream and you have done that. Prayed with us this morning. Indicate that. Amen. Uh, on, on, on the page that we're on. We'd love to rejoice with you. Pray with you. Amen. Pray for you. We are a people of power. We know people that need Jesus. We know people in our lives that are not right with God. We know family members, people we love, that if, if the rapture happened or, or if they passed away right now, they would not be in eternity with God. We know people like that. It's your job. He's filled you with power. Amen. He chased me down at a McDonald's. Come on, somebody. He got me out of there, away from there, into an atmosphere where I could get saved. Amen. God is chasing you right now. God is looking for you right now. You can respond to it. Let's be a people that witness and testify. 
You know somebody that needs Jesus. You'll, you'll, you'll make a commitment. And the next week, you're going to notify them. You're going to call them, test them, see them, knock on their door, something. And be a witness. This altar is open. You come. Find a place to pray. Lay hold of God this morning. You are worthy, Lord, I give you praise. I magnify your name. Amen.